uh, today's topic is going to be part of the lectures uh, to address uh, the dental care for medically compromised individuals. Specifically, today we are going to talk about uh, patients suffering from renal conditions, gastrointestinal conditions, endocrine conditions, and patients with cancer. The broader theme is to the work with the team, work with the team. And I also uh, uh, wish to convey my regards from Federation of Special Care Dentistry. Uh, we have running into the second year now. This is specially to address and uh, make a forum for the, for, the, for the dentists and the medical fraternity to, to join hands to serve the needy people who are the patients with the special needs. I welcome all the participants to participants to join this group and uh, share your uh, uh, time, your knowledge and clinical skills to serve the, to the needy. The oral cavity is in the intersection of medicine and the dentistry and the window to the general health of the patient. This is very true as we have many studies which address the relationship between and the systemic disease. And there is a association between the oral condition system and disease. But the problem is we need not address such issues with the context of the disease, but the good oral health alone justifies preventing the oral disease and maintaining the oral health so that it reduces the burden on the people who are already burdened with the systemic condition. So there is a weak relationship that every oral condition is going to be affecting the systemic disease. But having the good oral hygiene alone is going to be a greatest benefit for these people so that they are not going to be additionally burdened with the dental disease. So with this context, we are going to look at the whole uh, the topic. As a dentist or a dental surgeon, you are going to play a role of either a primary consultant or a secondary consultant. I'm trying to lay down a theme of the team so that we will find the place where we are going to be so that we will play a key role in, 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 in the medical uh, uh, therapist as a dentist and as a, as a cog of the bee. When you have your patient admitted under you, it will become obviously a primary consultant. And when you refer your patient for a medical doctor, then he is going to be the secondary consultant. That is, a physician can refer a patient to the dentist before they start the medical treatment, or a dentist can refer the patient to a physician before, for the medical assessment before we initiate the dental treatment. So it's all going to start with the prevention, and it is going to start with before the, before the, the, the treatment plan happens. We do, have, we do work under three, two situations. One, either we work in the office space to dental practice or in a hospital where you are part of a team. Our practice broadly divides into a regular dental clinical procedures provided in a dental office for an ambulatory inpatients or outpatients or provision of the care for the bedside patients admitted in a hospital for the medical reasons or an inpatient who is in a hospital for purely dental condition. These are the various conditions under which we work and help the people. Before we go further, there are three essential tools we have to keep in our practices and be familiar with. That is one, the pulse oximeter, uh, the glucometer, and the sphygmomanometer. That's a BP apparatus. Thanks to COVID, we all know about pulse oximeter now, but the rest of the two should be should be familiar with us in our dental practices. Whether we, we do practice and cater patients with special needs or not, these are three essential tools which should be a great benefit to your practice. So it's, it's important to keep them handy. I'm sure all of us have this. If nobody has it, probably we should procure these three tools which will make our dental practice much more comfortable and safer for for, for people who suffer from systemic conditions. And especially when you, when you are handling uh, a, a stranger as a patient to come to your practices, you should be 
familiar with all these tools with you. We also need to be aware of something called clinical alert monitoring. We always do this when you are in a practice. Only thing is we don't realize that we are, we are observing these things. One is consciousness, that is to, to assess the response to the patient, response of a patient to your verbal command. This way we'll know whether the person is conscious or he has any altered uh, uh, sense of consciousness. We also need to monitor the respiration or rate of respiration. And we also need to know about saturation of the patient. Fortunately for us, we work in an environment surrounded by the mucosa, which is a true replica of the saturation of the body, total mucosa. Apart from that, as we mentioned, the blood pressure monitoring and the pulse monitoring is also an essential part of uh, a general monitoring of the patient. Today, we are going to talk about the, the, the oral health care in medically compromised individuals suffering from renal, gastrointestinal, endocrine conditions, and patients with cancer. Let's start with uh, renal diseases. Uh, our intention of uh, doing this series of lecture, as I understand, is not to make dentists to diagnose a medical condition, but we need to understand that these patients are already diagnosed, but they do come with a dental problem uh, while they're suffering from a systemic condition. So this is something I want you to be, be aware of. We are not here to diagnose a dental disease but, or, or a medical condition, rather address the medical condition with the context of the dental treatment or, or, or uh, the dental condition in a person suffering from a, a systemic condition. To start with, we are going to talk about renal diseases. I'm going to address the most common conditions which we come across instead of trying to discuss every condition which are there in the literature or the textbooks. The most common renal conditions we come across in our practices are chronic renal failure, or it's called CRF, when the glomerular filtration rate is between 10% to 25 That means the compromise of the kidneys will goes by to about 10 to 25% of the normal. We also have end stage renal disease. The chronic renal failure, if not addressed at the right time, the logical end to that will be an end stage renal disease. So at some point of time, chronic renal failure, if not addressed well, it will end up into end stage renal disease where the patient is going to be maintained with renal replacement therapy. That means, we are going to provide the function of the kidney by an artificial means through wherever, whatever uh, uh, facility we have. The point is that uh, we are going to provide the function what kidney, when working normally, is going to provide in a person who suffers from end-stage renal disease. So at the end-stage renal disease, uh, depending on the staging of the uh, the, the staging of the function of the uh, kidney, ultimately, these patients do require renal transplants, that is replacement of the kidney. They say we are always lucky to have two kidneys, so we have many people who would offer one kidney for a person who needs replacement, or we also procure these kidneys from, uh, from cadavers or person who died recently. The, the hallmark of uh, renal disease is the multi-system involvement. Most of them do survive with diabetes along with the kidney disease. Sometimes it is the very diabetes which results in, in kidney disease or kidney element. Since the kidneys are involved with the regulation of uh, uh, electrons, elect electrolytes, electrolytes, the cardiovascular function is going to be compromised and the cardiovascular function or uh, misfunction is going to be part of the uh, issues we need to address. And they also suffer from immune compromise by the virtue of the kidney disease or during the transplantation or the post-transplantation during the uh, immunosuppression uh, period post-transplantation. So these are the issues we need to address during, the, uh, during we, our encounter with the patients suffering from renal disease. The most common oral signs of the renal disease, which we may have to see and recognize, is the pallor in the mucosa. They, have, they do have pale mucosa. 
and we can smell ammonia-like odor in the breath, stomatitis, accelerated rate of calculus. So they, they tend to form more calculus. So they need more number of scalings and hygiene maintenance and more frequently. Xerostomia, the loss of saliva, reduced amount of uh, saliva production in the mouth so that the mouth becomes dry and that itself can be predisposing to various dental conditions and the uh, oral disease conditions. When they do have wounds, the wounds will be delayed in healing and they do come across periodontal issues and which results in premature loss of the teeth. So all these things are, are the common features which we see in a patient or a person with renal disease. Adults and children with renal diseases are more prone for infection because the kidney being a filter for the blood and all the infection in the blood, wherever it is in the body, whether it can be in the oral cavity or anywhere in the distant places, moment it gets into the blood and it is going to be affecting the kidney. So the kidney, which is already compromised in its function, is going to be additionally affected because of the infection wherever it is in the body. Mouth being one of the important sources of infection, even when it is subclinical infection in the mouth, in, when the immune system is compromised, sub, that subclinical infection can be deterrent for the total health of the kidney and health of the patient. The drugs, what we do use as part of the dental treatment, it could be either antibiotics or analgesics, but none of them should be nephrotoxic. That means any drug which is going to be filtered out of the kid, filtered out of the body through the kidney is going to be an additional burden to the kidney. The most common drugs as a dentist, what we use is either antibiotics or antivirals and analgesics, especially NSAIDs. We do prescribe painkillers more often than, than any other clinician in medicine, probably because of the pain what a patient encounters. So we need to be absolutely careful when we decide to give a prescription and make sure that the drugs should not be metabolized or the minimum amount of the drug should be metabolized in the, in the kidney and the drug should be maximum metabolized in the liver or the choose the drugs which are metabolized in the liver, which is very, very important in, in writing your prescription. Because of the metabolism of the calcium and uh, certain hormones, the bone metabolism is also affected in a person with, uh, with uh, renal conditions, especially in, in, uh, 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 especially in uh, chronic kidney disease who are affected by metabolic, metabolic bone disorder. And this would further affect the healing of the bone and the density of the bone and that need to be kept in mind because the teeth are in the bone and the bone need to be, uh, bone need to be assessed for its health and the repair uh, for its uh, regeneration, especially during periodontal conditions. And this is also because of renal osteodystrophy. So uh, the, the, since, since uh, the, the dentists do depend a lot on the teeth and the support of the teeth in the bone and the periodontal tissue, the metabolism of the bone is going to be a significant role player in the outcome of the dental treatment in a patient suffering from renal diseases. As the patient passes through the end stage renal disease, at some point of time, they will end up in dialysis. Dialysis is basically to perform the kidney's function uh, by an external means when the kidneys do fail in their function. We do have two kinds of hemo uh, two kinds of dialysis. One, the hemodialysis, and the second one is the peritoneal dialysis. We are more concerned about hemodialysis because the peritoneal dialysis do not have much relevance to dental health and the dental conditions because. the dialyzing solution is going to be the peritoneum without getting into the blood circulation. So the peritoneal membrane is going to be helping in, in exchange of uh, noxious materials from the blood into the peritoneum. And the, the dialyzing solution is going to absorb that and the dialyzing solution is going to be exchanged in a, in a frequent uh, period. But when it comes to hemodialysis, hemodialysis basically performed by a dialyzer, hemodialyzer, which is an external device. And uh, hemodialysis do happen uh, at least 
at least about three to four times a week depends on depending on how affected the kidney is how affected how, how uh, disease the kidney is uh, each hemodialysis will take anywhere between four to six hours depending on the patient and the machine and it would happen many times a week and the person who requires hemodialysis will have a portal of entry through an art arteriovenous fistula that means they are going to have an access into the uh, 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 vasculature by a fistula, which is a minor surgical procedure through which they are going to insert a cannula, and the cannula is going to be connected through the uh, 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 to the dialysing machine. And because of this external environment, this because of this uh, interface between the skin and the external environment there is always a possibility of ingress of infection and the bacteria through this heavy fistula. So whenever you come across a patient with hemodialysis, especially, we need to consider antibiotic prophylaxis because of uh, the bacteremia, which is going to be accessing through the heavy fistula. The second aspect which we need to keep in mind is that uh, uh, the heparinization, because the blood is going to be circulating in and out of the body, when it is out of the body, we don't want the clotting mechanism to happen. So heparin is going to be mixed in the blood so that the, 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 the blood is going to be maintained in its liquid position when it is going through the dialyzer during its purification or, or, or uh, hemodialysis. So when heparin is going to be mixed during, heparin, um, during dialysis, and the dialysis is going to happen anywhere between four to six hours, all through the dialysis, the heparin is going to be circulating in the body. Once the dialysis come to an end, it will take anywhere between two to four hours for the, for the heparin to reach its half-life dosage so that it reaches the target of less than 0.25 international units per ml. So that if you have to do a procedure, theoretically, we can, we can do within four hours after we finish the dialysis only if it is an emergency procedure. But given a choice, we know that hemodialysis is going to take a long time, anywhere between two to four hours. The patient is going to be very tired. Unless it is an emergency, the procedure always needs to be considered about 12 hours later than uh, the, the dialysis. That is, ideally, it is to be done about a day after the dialysis happens. But also keep in mind that when the person is going to be through the dialysis three to four times a week, almost every alternate day is going to be under dialysis. So this timing and the timing of the treatment of the dental disease is going to be very well be considered based on the dialysis uh, schedules. The, all the elective dental procedures, as I said, it should be postponed for about 12 hours time, ideally the day after the person undergoes the dialysis so that you don't have any remnant uh, tiredness of the patient and the heparin is fully out of the body and, and the patient is going to be uh, comfortable during the dental procedure in between the two days of dialysis. It's also important that we adjust the dosage of the drugs which we give as part of a dental treatment because the drug is also going to be eliminated or filtered out of the blood as part of the dialysis. So we need to adjust the doses upward or downward depending on which drug we use, especially when we use antibiotics. We need to factor in the amount and dosage of the drug, which we may have to consider given additional bolus dosage after the dialysis happens so that we maintain the blood uh, 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 concentration of the antibiotic which we intend to give. So this is something which we need to keep in mind, especially when we have to do a treatment in a person who's undergoing dialysis. And when it goes to a stage where the patient is going to undergo transplant, the patient is also going to be referred to your dentist for pre-renal transplant protocol. The pre-renal transplant protocol should especially address the dental issues and periodontal issues and pericoronal sources of bacteria because Post-renal transplant, the patient is going to be on immunosuppressives for about uh, 
for about six months on a high, high dose uh, immunosuppressions. And any flare up of infection, the seemingly simple infection pre transplant can turn out to be a life threatening uh, condition in a patient post renal transplant. A successful renal transplant can sometimes fail because of a simple dental condition. So it's very important that we address pre-renal transplant protocol to eliminate all sources of bacteremia so that the person is going to be free of any bacteremia post-renal transplant. The post-renal transplant can be conveniently divided into immediate post-transplant and long-term post-renal transplant. So within six months after the post renal transplant, the patient is going to be on immune suppression. We don't want any kind of infection arising anywhere in the body and dental infections are going to be most ignored part, especially in countries which are developing because of the economic resources, the dental checkups are bypassed. And uh, finally, after the successful renal transplant, a seemingly simple dental infection or a periodontal infection can jeopardize the whole success outcome or the prognosis of the renal transplant. So it's very important that we address and the renal transplant surgeons uh, should be made aware of your availability to address such a bacteremia and oral conditions. And sometimes these, these checkups should be done entirely free of cost because the person who cannot afford Not afford anything else, uh, 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 which going to be which case is going to be the uh, uh, deterrent of the whole outcome. So sometimes, uh, is I mean audible? Yes, it's just breaking up a little, but you're fine. But I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, so people who goes through renal transplant in six months because of the hormonal adjustments and suppression, they are going to going to a lot of stress, both in terms of their hospitalization because of the adrenal suppression. So we need to provide a stress-free environment for them so that they don't, they don't end up in a crisis. They don't end up in a stressful crisis. The long-term post-renal transplant, which may go on beyond six months, sometimes it go on for a few years, where they continue to have the low level immune suppression going on through this long term post renal transplant period though it may not be that bad as far as the dental infection but dental infection do still result in a in a in a in a condition which is going to be uh, a burden for a person who undergoes a renal transplant uh, uh, so we still have to maintain the oral hygiene on a regular basis eliminate all sources of, of infection, which you already considered eliminating pre-renal transplant, but we have to maintain such a condition so that they don't revert back to such a disease state in the oral cavity. And we do maintain long-term bacteremia-free mouth uh, uh, for such patients. Because of the immunosuppression, the gingival hyperplasia do happen in most of the patients and meticulous oral hygiene maintenance will reduce the gingival hyperplasia significantly. So frequent oral prophylaxis and uh, proper uh, 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 maintenance at home will definitely will not allow the gingival hyperplasia to set in at the first place. Once they set in, then surgical and uh, uh, surgical uh, uh, elimination of that, and uh, there are other ways of doing it, but most of the times elimination of the uh, the plaque control and elimination of the periodontal infection will significantly reduce the gingival hyperplasia. Some of the patients, depending on the kidney function, they may even consider uh, uh, putting them on antibiotic prophylaxis, but antibiotic prophylaxis may not be uh, the routine, but depending on the nephrologist's opinion, we may have to consider antibiotic prophylaxis uh, at some point of time, but not as a routine. Uh, especially during renal diseases, we may have to consider uh, 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 monitoring their blood pressure. And we also need to keep in touch with, uh, or we need to monitor their serum creatinine 
for adults it were uh, for adult men it can be anywhere between 0.74 to 1.35 milligrams per deciliter and uh, and uh, in adult uh, women it can be anywhere between 0.59 to 1.04 milligrams per deciliter so uh, any serum creatinine raised indicates uh, that uh, build up of uh, uh, noxious materials creatinine in the in the in the blood which indirectly indicates the function of the kidney and you need to carefully weigh your options whether to consider doing the treatment and what precautions you have to make so we need to be in consistent touch with the general practitioner general medical practitioner or or or, or nephrologist who is taking care of the patient especially we need to update them about the drug interactions of the drugs which you are going to use and and we may have to uh, coordinate with uh, with uh, dialysis schedule and the protocol and time your dental procedures so that uh, we don't disturb the uh, 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 disturb the dialysis uh, protocol for them so these are the few issues which we need to address in a patient with uh, with uh, renal disease